Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a renowned fire expert discusses wildfire policies and firefighting procedures in the aftermath of the Yarnell Hill tragedy. And we'll meet sculptor Kevin Carone, who traded a life of truck driving for a noted career in the world of art. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona Senator John McCain is vowing to block General Martin Dempsey's nomination for a second term as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. McCain said today that he's frustrated with what he sees as Dempsey's vague response when asked about his personal opinion of Syria. McCain says he wants more answers. And Senator McCain earlier this week joined Senator Jeff Flake to introduce legislation that gives federal agencies more incentive to hire private companies to clear trees and other vegetation that serve as fuel for wildfires. The legislation comes after 19 firefighters died battling the Yarnell Hill Fire June 30th. The bill will give the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service more flexibility in working with businesses that harvest trees. McCain said in a statement that, quote, thinning our forests will reduce the fuel load for wildfires and make them more manageable for our firefighters. Senator Flake also released a statement that says, in part, we must use every resource at our disposal to prevent devastating wildfires. The Yarnell Fire is prompting much thought into wildfire policies and firefighting procedures. ASU Regents Professor Stephen Pine has spent his career studying and writing about wildfires, and he, he joins us now. It's good to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. What are we learning about the Yarnell Hill Fire? Well, I think so far the evidence seems to suggest that um, we won't see any, any unusual fire behavior or any, anything unusual in the story. Uh, it just seems that... Um, Fire is always surprising us. Uh, it's always coming up with an intensity and a swiftness that we hadn't anticipated. I think it's a. I think it's going to turn out to be a classic definition of a, of a tragedy, that the fire did what the fire was was prepared to do, and the crews were doing what they were told to do, and they just clashed. So the fire wasn't any any larger or more intense than ordinary. Well, at this point, it doesn't seem to be. It was scaling up by the reports, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know all of the details, so I can't speak in real particulars. But the, the um, historic uh, situations involving these, these multiple fatality fires are that they are relatively small fires or small parts of big fires, or they're fires uh, where there's a rapid transition in the organization, and that seems to have been the characteristic here. In other words, they're in a place where uh, a puff of wind, uh, a shift, can, the fire can react very quickly. It's in grasses, it's in shrubs, brush. Um, if you want to get a fire going in your fireplace, you throw in um, needles mm -hmm. and grass. You don't put in a big log. With, with so, that in mind, it, it, we've heard the Forest Service say that this, this thing may have been moving quicker than expected. They're saying up to 15 miles an hour, average wildfire, they're saying moves around less than five miles an hour. Those numbers make sense to you? Well, they may make sense. I don't know the particulars here. They seem high to me unless the fire was spotting, that is to say throwing sparks and starting new fires ahead of it. Uh, the Wallow Fire was setting fires three or four miles ahead. So what is, the, what is the actual rate of spread? But you're dealing with, as I understand it, mostly grass and brush here, and that can, that can react very quickly. Okay. I want to get back to firefighting procedures mm -hmm. here in a second. But as far as fire and fire policy, you, you have said in the past that the paradox here is we actually need more fires, just not these kinds of fires, correct? Yeah, no, we, we have altogether uh, too much of the wrong kind of fire and way, way too little of the right kind of fire. We're not going to remove fire from these landscapes. I mean, unless you can stop plants from photosynthesizing and animals from breathing. I mean, this is, this is the way the earth is built. So um, the problem is that we, we've, we've created a kind of feral fire. We had, over long periods of time, people had managed to put landscapes into a more controlled form by doing their own burning. In other words, taking, mm -hmm. taking the punch out of lightning-caused fires because they've ignited those areas that they want protected first. And they've done that. They've done it under relatively controlled conditions. And you do this for hundreds or thousands of years, you've got the landscape in a form that you get the kinds of fires you want. We probably need three or four times more fire burned area in the state than we're getting. What we don't need are more of these explosive high-intensity fires. How do you avoid the explosive high-intensity fires? 
Well, you're always going to have some uh, in areas, and, and some kinds of biotas need it. That's just how they regenerate. But you can certainly restrain the, constrain the areas in which that occurs. And the rest is by taking control of the landscape. You know, in a sense, we've got an ecological insurgency, and you're not going to fight it by bombing it out of existence. Uh, you're not going to throw, you know, surges of engines and the rest and, and beat it down. You've got to take control of that countryside. And the fundamental way you'll do that is to substitute your fires, fires of choice, if you will, rather than fires of chance. Can, it's a big state. There's a lot of forest out there. There's a lot of wildland out there. Can we do this? Or is this one of these piecemeal things that has to be done over the course of a generation or two? Well, unless you're willing to invest in something on the scale of the CCC, you're not going to take care of this in three or four or five years. You're, you're talking about several decades. But we don't have to instantly cover the entire state. Target the areas that are most at risk. Certainly, you can, you can clean up around communities. You can make houses responsible for their own protection, homeowners. Then you can take care of the communities, and then you can move out uh, from there. But at that point, you're talking about private land, uh, property rights, you're talking about a whole series of negotiation between what individuals have a right to do and what potential threat that may pose to neighbors. How are you going to agree on this? Who's going to pay? Who's going to benefit? <laughs> Suddenly yeah. it looks very political. Yeah, and, and it, it, it is. I, and it is, and it's very complicated as well. I'm just wondering, is this the new normal here? I mean, we're hearing that fires are burning twice as many acres as they did 40 years ago. The fire season's starting earlier. It's ending later. you got the droughts going longer. The winter is shorter. We're not getting nearly the snowpack. I mean, it's, it's all adding up to... Huh. Yeah, it probably is, but, you know, a little history may be helpful. If you went back 100 years ago, we had a lot more area burning. And what happened was that by a series of, of measures, some deliberate, some accidental, fire was pretty much scrubbed out of the landscape. And so by the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, we had a new normal of fire which was fairly low. And a really large fire might be two or 5,000 acres. This was a monster fire. And then by the end of the 80s, we start coming back with drought. We've got a legacy of all the stuff we've done and not done to the landscape. We've got a lot of stuff to burn out there. We're putting houses out there. So you change the dynamic, and now we're seeing these big and damaging fires come back. Well, in some ways, we were through this before, uh, and we should be able to, to learn from it. But even if we're, you know, we're having seasons that start earlier, go later, that's also an expanded window for doing your own burning. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to do that, you have to think about liability. Who's going to handle that? You're going to have to think about smoke. How much are you willing to tolerate? There are all kinds of other trade-offs. And the simplest solution, unfortunately, is the one we've got, which is to say, treat fire as an emergency. So it happens. Nobody's responsible. You're applauded if you send everything you've got at it. And you know if there are casualties or large expenses, well, it's an emergency. You did what you had to do. And that, that's just it. So it begins looking a lot like healthcare, And in some ways, it's got the same kind of systemic issues involved, which makes it very difficult to solve. But we don't have to solve it all. We can identify the areas that are most at risk, target those. We know lots of things to do. And if we can reach consensus that, yeah, we're willing to do this, and we all accept the decisions, then there's plenty we can do. And this, actually, we can't blame on the feds. This was state land. Right. In private land. Regarding a development encroaching on the wildlands here, I mean, it, obviously there has been an issue. Yeah. Uh, is it? Does it continue to be an issue? Has that? I mean, did the recession slow that down a little bit, or is that just still becoming an issue out there? Well, it's it's reviving. I mean, it, it slowed down with the recession, uh, but but that's a pretty grim way to solve your problems. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we should be able to deal with this in other ways. I mean, I think what we're looking at is a large-scale recolonization of rural America by an urban outmigration. And so you're not living on the land. You're just in it. Uh, you're not doing things that a rural economy would have. So during the 19th century, with an agricultural uh, colonization, we, we had huge fires, terrible fires, burning whole communities down. Well, that went away because we stopped moving. Now we're moving again. We've got another cycle of frontier burning, if you will. And yeah, there are lots of things we can do, but we have to be able to, to agree on it. 
But I'll tell you the spooky thing. Right now, this is, this is presented as primarily a Western problem, Western U.S., so it's not a national issue in, in a serious way because we're moving houses to where the fires are. But if climate keeps changing, and we're starting to see this already in the southeast and elsewhere, the fires are going to start moving where the houses are, and that's in the eastern U.S. And at that point, we've got a real game changer. Wow. That's the spooky scenario. Uh, yeah, that's uh, disquieting to say the least. <laughs> um, as far as what Senator McCain and Senator Flake are talking about, the idea mm -hmm. of getting private companies up there into the woods, into the forest, I know the Four Forests Initiative, we had you on regarding that. That seems to have stalled. That seems so much promise uh, with the idea of, of, of public-private partnership of getting. Uh, why is that not feasible? So many folks say that you can't do it, and so many folks like Senators McCain and Flake saying you've got to do it. Well, you've got to make choices. And you know who who benefits and who and who pays. Um, it's not a new idea. I mean, for the last 15 years, Congress has authorized stuff, um, stewardship projects and, and other programs to cl begin cleaning up around these communities and doing stuff. And a lot of that, it's not the federal workforce that's doing it; they're contracting out. Mm -hmm. So, what what I what I sense in, in their latest proposal is that they found a little pot of money that might be available to be redirected to that. But we're talking about thousands of communities. And, and those are just the communities. That doesn't deal with all the landscape issues about right. building some kind of resilience into our wildlands so that we have something left when this wave of fire, I mean, in the worst scenario, you take the global change scenario, it's sort of Star Trek Genesis device, if you're familiar with that, where they set off this thing and it remakes the whole planet in its own matrix, <laughs> burning it over. Well, yes. that in a sense is what's starting to happen in places, is that we don't know what's going to come back in a lot of these uh, landscapes under these intense fires. So that's sort of one extreme of that. But we're seeing, we're seeing a few patches of that happening. Uh, back to the Yarnell Hill situation here. There's just so much to cover, and thank you again so much for joining us. Does, from what you've seen and from your experience looking yeah. into these, does it look like sta so standard operating procedures, were, were, were they in place? Well, everything I've seen about it says yes. They were doing what they were supposed to. They had a lookout. They, they, they had you know, meteorological information coming to them. I just don't know what happened in this, in this particular set of circumstances. But I think the fire community may respond as it has in the past, not waiting for policy changes or political solutions, and simply put in some new operating instructions, which, which are to say, we, we now identify houses that are indefensible. We're not putting engines or crews to defend them. We may step back and start saying, there are whole communities here, or dispersed settlement clusters that are too dangerous in whole, we're not putting people in. Or we may decide that when you've got extreme conditions, everything from you know high temperatures, low humidities, possible downdrafts, and the rest of it, we're not putting crews in. If you can't fly, and they couldn't fly air tankers that afternoon, then why do we have crews in? So the, community, the fire community itself may start moving in that direction. So I know after the dude fire, there were a lot of changes regarding wildfire uh, policy and firefighting procedures. Are you expecting similar changes here? Because sometimes the act of God yeah. nature of all this is that you did the best, there's not much more you can do. There's got to be some sort of procedural change here. Well, there, there almost certainly will be, but at, at this point I, I just have the sense of a, classic, of a classic tragedy. I'm not sure that we're going to learn new lessons. Wow, we never realized that before. Or this was fire behavior we've never, we've never seen. Uh, I, think, I think it's probably going to come down to it was just the the collusion of all these little things that came together and this crew at exactly the wrong time and wrong place, uh, it collided. But I would be surprised if we don't see uh, a kind of pullback by the agencies and mm -hmm. simply saying we cannot, under extreme conditions, defend these places. We're not putting people at risk. But those are also exactly the conditions when the fires are most explosive and when they're going to run the furthest. And unlike sort of a city fire where a building burns down, you're talking about multiplying by thousands or tens of thousands of acres the yeah. size of this. So now you've got a huge problem. So that brings us back to the question of taking control of the countryside, in effect, putting that landscape into a form that now you can deal with the bad fires that you don't want and you can somehow promote or substitute the ones you do want. All right. 
It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Well, I hope it's under a more cheerful set of yeah, circumstances. Well, once, yeah, we'll talk about the wild lands in a better, better form. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Twice a month on Arizona Horizon, we bring you up to date with the latest from the local art scene. And tonight, we meet Phoenix sculptor Kevin Carone, who came to art later in life after serving in the Navy, running an auto repair shop, and driving a semi. Kevin Carone joins us now to talk about his work. It's good to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, boy, there's so much to talk to you about. I want to get to all these, these past lives in a second, but I want to start with the fact that you make sculpture out of metal. Not Why? Not. Why? Because I actually tried wood at one point, and I found that we didn't get along. And I tried uh, metal. There was a, uh, we needed a privacy screen in our backyard. And I kept looking for the right kind of wood, never could find it. I came across this piece of conveyor belt and brought that in and made this screen and put it up. And everybody went, wow. You know, and even my, even my wife looked at it and said, that's amazing. Go get the rest of that. I took some of that screen, and I turned it the other way, and I made a fountain out of it. And people were just amazed. You know, that fountain is still running in my backyard. And off you went. And off we went from there. Are there limits working with metal that help you in the creative process? It's almost like you, you have to know the rules to be able to, to break the rules. I mean, because you can't do everything with metal, does that help a little bit? Sure, sure, because that just uh, that infuriates me more. And that <laughs> makes, me, makes me want to make this metal do something that it's not made to do. So... I need to learn a new process. I need to get a new piece of equipment. I need to need to make that metal bend to my will instead of its. And, and talk about your will here. Do you see what you want to make in your mind and then you get right to it? Or do you see a piece of metal and say, I think I can do something with that, start to work, and then are surprised at the finished product? That's how I started earlier. Yeah, that's how I started out at the very beginning was using found objects. Um, when I was driving the semi, I was doing a lot of reverse engineering in my head, you know, just at the shapes that I would see, something to keep my mind occupied while I was driving. And that led me into being able to do sculpture because now I knew, I knew what my finished piece was. I could take it apart and say, well, I need a piece like this, I need a piece like that. You know, and, and then I could start with flat sheets and say, well, now I just have to create all the pieces and put it together. So when you say you want a piece like this, does it wind up a piece like this, or does it wind up a piece like that? Almost never. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, art, art, I feel art is alive you know, on its own. The piece is alive. It, it wants to be born, but mm, I would say maybe 70% of the time it actually comes out the way I see it in my brain. Do you wait for the muse, or do you sit there and say, I'm, I'm starting to work now, muse. Come find me. I, yes, I start to work now. You need to be down here to be able to help. <laughs> Or uh, you know, working off of a CAD drawing, or or just you know letting her run through the grassy fields of my mind, and I go where she goes. Well, let's take a look at some of your work. As and as we look at this, I want to ask you about, as far as you know, uh, big pieces, small pieces. It's is there a difference there in terms of how you approach, obviously, and how you create to some degree, though. How do you differentiate between the two? Because you make some pretty big pieces. I, I don't think I do. Um, you know, the, the small little pieces that I can make on my bench right in front of me, you know, the, these, are, these are the fun little bugs, the little ants, yeah. you know, the little critters that I make. You know, the, those are fun to work with. But when it comes time for the bigger pieces, I just need the bigger machinery. I need the bigger table. I need more space. So the, the creative process is still similar or the same? I, I think it's the same. It's just scaled up. Do you use special tools? And, and it, with those special tools, did you have to get special training? I am self-taught. 
I, I am entirely self-taught at this. I, I had a very, very tiny, tiny little bit of, of training and welding way back in high school. And when I became a sculptor, I you know, expanded on that training. I've learned you know, several different types of welding, all the machine work, all the bending, shaping, uh, yeah. all self-taught. All self-taught. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get to this business of you starting late as an artist. How did this come about? As we continue to watch, these are, these are absolutely beautiful pieces here. Um, it's hard to believe that this guy was in an auto repair shop and driving a semi. I mean, were you an artist? driving a semi or were you a truck driver just waiting to be an artist? I was a bored truck driver that needed something to keep my mind occupied. You know, when, when you would get to, when I would get to a place to make a delivery while I was waiting for that forklift to come out to unload me, I would be looking at the big scrap pile in the backyard and playing mentally with the different pieces, you know, how this goes together, how that goes together. And, and I think that's where a lot of the sculpture came from, you know, just that ability to look at found objects and make them something different. When you were young, you were in the Navy for a while there, and then uh, you ran your auto repair shop as well. Even back when you were younger than that, when you were a kid, was there always an artistic bent, or was it just... It, no, not at all. How did, then, then what, it, what happened? I mean, the meditation, the idea of looking at something and saying, I can do something, that had to start somewhere. Was there a moment? Was there a, a flash? I, I think it was just driving the truck. You know, and, and, and just keeping myself occupied there. You know, the, the, the leap to art came with that privacy screen. And everybody was so excited about it. And they were so excited with the fountain. Well, I had more of that material left over. I had to do something with it. Sure. So I would make a different thing. And people were excited by that. And then a gentleman showed up one day with five $100 bills in his hand and said, can I have one? And you said yes. I said, time out. Wait, did it paid? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and with that in mind, you are now a professional artist. Right. You're not driving trucks anymore, you're as far as I can tell, and you're not running an auto repair shop. Right. Um, is it what you thought it would be? I mean, we've heard of you know the, the poet who worked as an insurance agent and, and other people who did other things while they were creating art. Um, before you were full-time as an artist, it, it, did you find the creative process any different than it is now? Wow, great question. Um, yes, you know when I was when I still had a job, I still had a paycheck coming in, you know, on a regular basis. I could be a little more lax about the things I was making. Mm -hmm. I could be a little more creative. I could I could do something really really wild because I knew I had plenty of time. But you know, once I became a professional artist, and you know, this was my job. Well, you know, now there are the bread and butter pieces that I have to make, and then there are the commissions that I that I work on that I dearly love, and then there are the spec pieces that I work on. That well, okay, I can put this one aside because I have a commission to make, and I can come back to that later. Does that make for pressure, or does it just mean you get to do more of what you love to do? I get, I get to do more. Yeah. I, I get to do plenty more. You know, now I'll, I'll normally have three to four pieces going at a time. And I'll work on this one for a little while. And, well, if this one has a time schedule on it, well, I'll go back to this, and this one will get set aside. But, you know, every now and again, that one that's been sitting there for a couple of months yeah. will raise its little hands and say, hey, how about <laughs> me? And I get, get a day to play with that and just do something really wild. Raises its steel hands and right, says, uh, right, kind of like a clang, right, clang, clang. Right. <laughs> um, you are all over YouTube. I mean, you've got uh, like a couple hundred videos, you got a couple few million viewers. What's that all about? That was a dear friend of ours back on the East Coast saying, you really got to try this. Uh, it, you know, it, it's great for the numbers. It's, it builds a great community. Uh, and it's just another way to get your name up, another way to be in front of people. So what started out as uh, just doing an art video, you know, talking about this piece mm -hmm. or talking about how I make something, uh, quickly turned into a process video. How, you know, how is the welding done? How is the shaping done? You know, where do the ideas come from? And, and I've got a whole community now. I've got people all over the world who email in and they want to ask questions and they email suggestions on new videos to make. And it's great. That's a, it's a great way to work, isn't yeah, it? That is. and, of course, you couldn't do that 10, 15 years ago because nope. there was no YouTube, or at right. least not the way we know it now. Right. So with that, uh, technology has to be a factor in your art, or does it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great influence in my art, really, because now with the computer, with CAD programs, you know, computer-aided drawing, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of sculpting that gets done right on the computer. When I am making a proposal for a public or a private sculpture for a commission, I can design the piece right there in 3D. I can take a picture of the location that it's going to be placed in, hopefully, and put that image right into that 
into that photo so I can show it to the person so they can see this is exactly what it's going to look like. So it, it's been a, a great influence in my work. Uh, and another way for you to develop and continue, to continue your success, continued success to you. And thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. It's been it. a pleasure. Thank you. And Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. Lawsuits over a number of state laws and an executive action by the governor all hit the courts this week. And the battle over solar energy incentives heats up big time. Those stories and more Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.